everyone and welcome to another Scots Way podcast. Today I'm joined by poet and novelist Ron Buckland. Hello Ron. Hi there. And we're going to talk about the new novel So Many Lives and All of Them Are Yours, which is a sequel and a prequel to The Sound of My Voice, uh, which as you know Ron, because I've said it before, is a particular favourite of mine. How was it for you to revisit the characters from The Sound of My Voice? It was very strange. It was really very strange. And at first, I didn't even realise that's what I had done. Um, I'd written the first few pages of what I thought might be a new story or a new novel. I wasn't quite sure which. And as usual at that stage, I kind of run it past my wife. So I, re- I read it, read it to her, and and I said, oh, I don't know, I don't know who this is or what it's about or anything. But you know, I feel there's something there. And she just said said, well, it's obvious, it's Morris, <laughs> out of your first novel. And I said, oh, that's nonsense. And really, I, I did think it was nonsense, actually. And then next morning, I started work on it again. And after a few minutes, I began to think, my God, yeah, mm, yeah, maybe she's got it right. <laughs> and then I changed the name, and that's all the way, just changed the guy's name, changed a few other things, and suddenly I could almost feel this novel I, I, no, not in detail but just the presence of something and that was that and it then went on after that So the novel was the same at the beginning but with this other person Yes just, of it that were the same. Yes just just the very beginning when he, when he arrives in, in the village I had this guy just arriving in an unnamed village I didn't even know where it was or or anything about it, and then I didn't, and then it went to something else, which didn't I, I, I ditched. And once I got found what it was, and it was Morris, suddenly the ground just felt just that I couldn't see the ground, but it felt a bit more solid underfoot, and I could begin to go forward and gradually. But I didn't write it in order. I never do write books in order. Right. I always just a like a whole lot of jigsaw pieces thrown around, you know. Uh, what was it uh, about the character then that your wife, what made her say this is Morris? That's a good question. I'll, <laughs> <laughs> ask, her. I'll ask her. <laughs> I'll ask her when I come back home. Because writer as well. So yeah, she's a, yeah, yeah, Reggie Clare, yeah, she's a novelist and poet as well. Mm. And uh, I, I will ask her actually. But to her it just seemed absolutely painfully obvious. Whereas for me it wasn't the least bit, you know. I'd love to know if there was this um, desire to learn more about Morris, because that's when I heard that you'd written this book, that's kind of how I felt. Right. Oh, I'm going to meet Morris McGillan, and some questions will be answered. Yeah. They are. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I think for me that was really kind of very exciting. Right. Yeah. Was it exciting for you, or what, is it, does it not feel oh, like Oh, yes. That? No, it certainly was exciting, because in, uh, as I was very... <laughs> Uh, impressed and also slightly alarmed by your introduction where you described this novel as being a sequel and a prequel <laughs> to, the, <laughs> to the sound of my voice because when I began to work on it then there were all these little scenes came up from Morris's past you know when he was a child and also scenes that were between the, the first novel and where it, at the time it's set now which is more or less present day and yes, and I didn't know any any of these details beforehand, and I felt I was getting to know him a bit better as more of it was kind of released to me or revealed to me almost. Yeah, uh, that's interesting um, because I think often. So you don't have a backstory for our characters in terms of. I was talking to a writer the other day who said they they know various things about their characters that don't appear in the novel. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, almost yeah. like an actor would do work the background of a character. Is that something that you do or, or not? Uh, no. I, I, I couldn't imagine doing that. Can I make that? I know that I, I, um, people, I'm told, when they're on writing courses, are sometimes told to write down all about the character before they even start. 
And that, to me, just makes no sense at all. And it's only once I get to know the character, which takes time and lots of pages, and then I can share that with the reader and they can get to know. If it was just a kind of list and go, oh, well, he can't do that because he's six foot two or he's, you know, yeah. he's, got, he's blonde hair and not brown or something. I mean, I would just get in such a muddle. Um, so really, I'd, I'd discover it. In fact, I, I, I would really say rather than write things, I always discover them, you know, as I'm going on. And that includes the story as well yeah. as the characters. Yeah. No, I was wondering about how you, you approached writing novels. Is it a case of bits and pieces at different times and you bring it together, perhaps different drafts? Or do you have an idea of where the story is going to go? Is it discovery for you? It's total discovery. I have no idea where it's going to go. Every morning I start out and I'm, I, I mean, I feel very lucky that I'm just as excited to get up and get to work every morning as when I started a long time ago. And, and I'm really wondering what's, you know, what's going to happen next. <laughs> you know, what, what, and I really, really don't know. And, but it, it gradually comes, but it doesn't come in order. Right. That would make it oh so much simpler. Because it wouldn't be all these cul-de-sacs that go down that just lead nowhere and just have to get ditched. And so what I'm end up with is a whole lot of bits. I mean, this book says about a couple of hundred pages. I mean I would say there must have been at least 30, 40 bits, I would think. You know, it's you know, page and a half here, page and a half there. Yeah. And and they're all over the place and all over the floor, literally. And as I said earlier, it's a bit like a whole lot of bits out of jigsaw. And I'm and I then try and think I get to a stage where I it's time to start trying to put this together and see what's really going on and where it's gonna really come to some kind of resolution. And it is like a jigsaw, but unfortunately there's no picture in the box. I, can't, I don't know what it is. So it's not a case of writing a lot and then editing down rather than writing scenes over and over and over till they're right, is that...? Uh, it's, it's that, yeah, because I would get, say, a page and a half, as I said, of a scene that might be about, end up maybe four or five pages in the novel. And then... Um, I would just the next day I would find them up and I'm at a completely different bit and I and yeah. I just start and and but this one sort of got started so I can go back to it and with a bit of luck there'll still be a bit of energy in it and I can pick it up but the energy is not working today there's something else that's demanding attention and so I would just keep going backwards and forwards like this until I've got pieces and then until I get a point where I can't go any further I really am a bit lost. And that's when I start trying to put it together there. I think it would be good for listeners who don't know the book and, or the books and the characters to maybe give an overview of Morris and maybe then I, I could, yeah. could read a little bit. But so who, who is Morris Miguel? And maybe start with the sound of my voice. That might be a bit when you first get yep. Morris. Well, we get Morris, we meet Morris first in, in the novel I wrote quite a, quite a few yeah, years ago. Yeah, I was surprised as well. When so I was I, yeah. Back. Goodness me, this, <laughs> this was way back in the 80s, yeah. late 80s, and it was when Britain was in the grip of Thatcher, as yeah. it was, you know, I mean, it really was a very difficult time for a lot of people. And for, you know, as they called them, the yuppies, the, the, the upwardly mobile people, it was a time of... You yeah, plenty. There's no doubt, no doubt about that, and it led to the '90s. And God, that was boom and bust of ever was. And what happened was, I just started this book about, about, about a guy that I didn't really know who he was, and then I realised gradually as it got going, he was an executive in a business, which I must say I've never been remotely near in my life. And and he had two kids, and he lived in the suburbs. And he was very successful. The only thing was, he was a functioning alcoholic. Yeah. And in a really extreme way. And he didn't see that as a problem. In fact, he saw it as a solution to yeah. life. You know, it kept him buzzing and kept him going and all the rest of it. And <clears throat> then in the, in the course of the book, uh, he begins to start uh, learning more and more about himself and realising, hmm, my goodness, this is not so good after all. And he begins to feel a kind of pain 
that the alcohol, so far at any rate, has been anaesthetising. Yeah. And then that, as he begins to feel the pain, so he begins to try and struggle and see where, where he might, what, where the healing might be. Yeah, he goes from functioning just to kind of non-functioning. To non-functioning, yeah. yeah. And at one point he, as I did actually, that was, there's not much that comes directly from my life at all, yeah. really. Um, but there was one particular scene that did, and that's where he sees uh, a suicide mm -hmm. in a station. Yeah. He's going to work, guy throws himself under a train right in front of his eyes. Same thing happened to me. I was, in, I was living in Paris at the time, and I was just going to get on the metro. But this guy came up and asked me the time, wow. and, uh, and I told him it, and then he, he sort of repeated it. And then the train started to come in the station and blow me, he just threw himself under the train right in front of me. Wow. And, but the thing was, I, could, I, didn't, he couldn't, I couldn't take it in. I thought it was a bit of yellow, he was wearing a yellow jersey, I think it was. And I thought it was a bit of yellow paper had blown in front of the cab. Mm. And then pff, I realised what had happened. And it... I didn't feel anything. Well, I felt very sorry yeah. for the guy, obviously, and not all that. But I didn't realise. But when I started to do, when I was I reached a certain stage in the novel, suddenly that scene came up, and in a way that helps trigger um, Morris's reassessment of where he is and, yeah. who, and, and who he is. Not in a very direct way, as you'd see when you read the book, but it certainly is a catalyst at one point, one of them. And when we left him at the very end of The Sound of My Voice, he's literally come to a halt. And there's a breakthrough, is that a fair description? Yes. At the very end? Yeah. At the, break th at the, at the, at the very end, we, there's a, most of the novel up until that point has been told in the second person, yeah. which I take, I mean, various critics have had different ideas about it, but I take that as a voice that's within all of us. Each one of us has got this kind of voice. It might be God, call it God, call it your imagination, your conscience, whatever. But it's the only thing in the universe that's totally on your side and trying to help you and guide you with what yeah. you're doing. And the problem is, of course, we hardly ever listen to it. Yeah. But it's telling us, and it, it, it kind of narrates the story in the, the, in the sound of my voice, hence the title. And, uh, and only near the end does he begin to hear it. Yeah. And when that happens, that's, he begins to feel the pain. But because he's beginning to feel the pain, it's a chance to begin the healing. And what I found interesting is in so many lives and all there are yours, the prequel stuff, the early days, is also written in the second That's person. right, yeah. And then the present day, I know it's not quite... It's, it's, yes, uh, it's... It's a bit more or less, yeah. it's kind of, yeah. That's how I read it. Yes, and, that's right. uh, and that is in third person. Here, in the third uh, person, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, was that a deliberate choice or is there no such thing? Is it just the way that the It was just the way it started? came. Yeah. It's just the way it came. I think, I mean, I, to be honest, I'd have to go back and look at the manuscripts. But I think that what I did after Reggie had spoken to me about uh, being Morris was tried it, first of all, in the second person, and I think that's what helped me get back yeah. and realise, yes, she's right, and also it helped me to get a, a bit of a way forward. But in fact, that section, the opening section, I, I, in, in the final, um, you know, in the book itself, as printed, where it, where it actually is in the third person because it got changed in the third, and you're right, it's what was happening more in the past that was in the second. And this I saw as kind of memories that were stirring and coming up because he, he goes to stay in the house in fact where he was born yeah and just being there stirs up these memories but he's not really aware of the memories but we get them we kind of overhear them stirring within him as it were and then gradually uh, 
he kind of becomes sort of aware of them, but not that much. And we get the narrator gives most of the present day stuff all in the third person, and yeah. that gives it this distanced feel to it. It also, for me, continues this idea that at the end of Sound of My Voice, he's had this breakthrough, and although he's had his tough time since, that is kind of continuing. He's still yes. a different person than he was for most of the Sound of My Voice. And he seems, he does seem a different person, and although he still has his tribulations and uh, his demons to fight, he does seem more content. Yes, he's more, he, he's, he has made a decision um, which uh, really kind of releases him, in not necessarily a very courageous way. Yeah. He decides, first of all, it, well, he's helped on his way, he's sacked for being a drunk and that forces him to change things in his life and then he's forced to, um, you know, basically see how his family have turned out, how his wife is and, and then eventually he reaches a point where he just thinks, no, I'm just leaving, I'm going to start again. Yeah. He thinks he'll start with a clean sheet, yeah. you know, but of course that never <laughs> happens yeah. at all. And. Um, Yes, and that's him then. It, it is, it, well, it is the same person, but he, he's so good at deceiving himself that he wouldn't even acknowledge that if he, if he was told it. Yeah, and I think <laughs> uh, that deception is in the sound of my voice And it's well. in the he sound of my it, voice too. He won't yeah. admit it. He won't admit it, yeah. he can't see it. Yeah. Um, could you give us a wee reading from sure. the book? That would be fantastic. Sure. Well, seeing as we've just said that about him leaving home, I'll just read a very short bit where uh, where he, he got before he got sacked, he, the, he moved, he got a sideways promotion. They just basically watered him out the head office, and he got moved. It was a biscuit company, yeah. a majestic biscuits, and he got moved to the Edinburgh branch of uh, majestic business. Of the, of, the, of the majestic business to administer biscuits for Scotland, as it were. And so he's, so he's here in, and he's living in Edinburgh. And in fact, Alistair, I just realised that because we're here, the bit I'm going to read happens out in the street outside. He walks <laughs> past. <laughs> yeah, well, we're uh, in Edinburgh, uh, the offices of uh, Berlin, uh, and I'm a publisher, and uh, a fantastic place to be talking to you. So it is, it's right outside this. It's right outside, yeah. He comes, uh, for those of you that know, that know Edinburgh, he comes uh, from, he's vaguely kind of Liberton and a kind of middle, middle management is ah, kind yeah. of uh, estate. And he then comes up, Cameron Toll, and he comes up through and through Newington and he'll go down the bridges to the Tron and the Royal Mile. <laughs> right. <clears throat> leaving home at 60 is very different from leaving it at 16. What had once been youthful hope had long since turned rancid. Oh, but hey, the sun was shining and as a farewell gesture you'd given the house, the car and everything else to marry your wife. No more roof repairs to worry about, no council tax, no insurance, no parking, no MOTs, no nothing. From this moment on, you were travelling light. It was a beautiful morning and only the most frivolous clouds had taken to the sky. You told them it was your birthday, toasted them all and yourself in a good long swallow. Coming to the rush hour, snarl and roar of the Cameron Toll intersection, you reviewed your immediate future. Was this the moment to peel off, hit the nearby shopping mall for an all-day breakfast? Your life now, your choice. Fantastic, thank you so much. And a lot of right to say that the characters stay with them. Um, you know, once even once the book has been written and, and published, does that happen to you? Do you think what did you ever did you ever think in the intervening years what's more? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> nope. Um, you know, because you you move on to doing doing other things, and because of that, you 
because it basically isn't the head. You want to give your full attention yeah. to what you're doing. So I don't really, once the book's done, I mean, I'm obviously very pleased when people read it and want to talk about it or, you know, I do readings and, and you know, and people then ask questions. I know it's, that keeps it all going. Yeah. But then eventually, you know, you maybe have another book after and another and by then it's really begun to sink out of sight altogether. So it was a complete out of the blue when Reggie said, oh, that's Morris from the sound of my voice. Uh, I didn't say Morris who, but I did remember. <laughs> but but uh, it wasn't something that had been in my mind at all. So when you were writing scenes that has early life, I mean, what's that like? Because you know what happens to his midlife from what I've been Yes. Of, and the complexity that's going on there. Did you feel, I mean, did you feel that you were going to justify or explain or was there never anything like that? No, it wasn't really anything. I, you asked me something about earlier where you, said, you asked if I chose, yeah. you know, bits, first person and third person and so on. And uh, I... It's not, for me, it's never a question of choice. It's yeah. just, it's a, it's more like, <laughs> a bit of a ridiculous analogy, but, you know, we've got a dog, so I, I'm thinking of our dog, and, and it smells out a scent, and, and it then, if it feels good, it will then follow it, and that's more what I do. Yeah. You know, there's bits, and then sometimes it leads to nothing, um, like, Poor Rhea very often leads to nowhere. And with me, yeah, it'll lead to a cul-de-sac in the writing and it, and it won't go anywhere. Right. And, and it's similar with, with, with that, with the first or third person, and also with what you were just saying. It's, it's more a kind of... It's not a... Th it's not... A, for me, that is. I mean, I know everyone works in their own, their own way and as yeah. long as it works... That's that's fine, but for me, I, I don't think much. It's not to do thinking's overrated, as I say in the book. Uh, for me, anyway, it, it's more really. I'm I'm trying to sense what what's got life, what's got got a sense, what's got energy, yeah, and and then just go with it and see where it takes me, and hope that it does take me take me somewhere. So when I came to do, to write these bits, I wasn't trying to work out what, what Morris How was like or anything. Ended up in that? No. Because you do bring in stuff about his family yes. and things like that. It's just that the, the scenes gradually came and they, they, they seemed to really, to, you know, probably, I mean, it, it's all going on in the subconscious. I'm yeah. quite sure of it. And, uh, and, they, and it, once I've got it, I begin to realise that, yeah, yeah, this is revealing a bit more about Morris or something like that. Yeah. And I just trust that my sense of smell is, good to, is guiding me. Because it's great, and uh, in the sound of my voice, it's an arresting opening, because the, the father died. And yes, the that's and, right. And also one of the reasons I think it blew me away when I first read it was... I hadn't read a lot of second person narration, but it's still quite rare. Yes, it's still not a full yeah. book, it's, it's yeah. still quite rare. And what it does for me as a reader is it makes you almost have to go back and pick through what you're reading. So the yeah. first time I read that opening chapter, I thought, okay, you know, he's at parties with someone and all this. Then you go back and you go, oh, this is quite a problematic situation. And, and you know, um, that idea of justification for your actions and what yeah. you're doing is kind of through it, and it allows that. Was mm. that just again? That's not something you chose to do. It was just the way that the it's just the way that the way the way that that it came, and and I'm guided by I don't know what. It, it, it's a bit difficult to put in words. I can only feel that it feels this feels right. Yeah. But the problem with that is, as I've, as I've already said, just because it feels right doesn't mean to say it is right. Because quite often I've something that feels, yeah, this is, whoa, this is the good, this is, and I'll do it and spend about a week writing a bit and then realise, in fact, it was not right, it wasn't going anywhere. And do you tend to know it's not right yourself? Well, gradually it begins to feel that the, the, the trail goes cold. Yeah. <laughs> to take this heroic metaphor even further. Yeah, yeah without a doubt, you yeah. know, and I realise, no, it doesn't, and, and I find it, the way I find it, actually, it's not that I think, oh, it's going cold, I, just quite simply, the words don't come anymore. Yeah. And and then I just realised, no, this isn't, it's not going anywhere. And I put it to one side, and then I'll maybe look at it again 
and see if maybe I'd miss something or cut it back and start it before I, I lost the trail. But usually if it goes cold, it goes cold. And in terms of the editorial process, working with an editor, if you've done all this work, are you fairly sure that this is almost the final? By, by that time, because I, I mean, uh, the, the, once I get all these bits all more or less in the right order and I've kind of try as, see, as I best I can to kind of seamlessly put them together. Um, that's it. I've got the first draft. And then that's when the work really begins, you know, and then I go through it. And I would go through loads of drafts. I mean, 20, 30, I would think, easily. And, and then, so by the time I get to an editor, um, I'm hoping that, you know, he's not going to say, oh, my goodness. <laughs> oh, no, you, you've completely forgotten all about this, so you've done it. You know, by then I'm hoping that we're really going to be down to, you know, choice of words here and there, corrections here and there, that kind of thing. You know, more, that more kind of editing. I mean, I had Edward Crossan here at, at Berlin, um, you know, as, as an editor, and he, and he was really good and he was really, really enthusiastic with, you know, trying to get into the novel and trying to see... For where I was coming from and where the book was going, and then you know once he once he'd read it fully, he just you know he, he had quite a lot of questions, quite a lot of things to to say, and we we just sat and worked through them. But they tended to be more um, of that nature rather than something fundamental. Yeah. You know, like oh no, it should all be in the second verse. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Because the the book itself it went through all of it first, second, third person. Ch Second Charlie, person, yeah, the whole right. thing, oh, yes. Right, okay. Just to, and it was to see what felt right, and then eventually it ended up with, with this, uh, as I as I say, in, in these two different two different voices. But I did have first person in it as well at one point. Just as an aside, um, is the village he goes to is that a real place? In my mind, it is. <laughs> in my mind, it, it's actually yeah. I mean, no surprises. It's a village I was brought up in. Just down in the borders. Down in the borders. Because my mum's from. She's from Annan. Oh right, well, so just along the just road. Just along the road. <laughs> I thought it was. I was kind of. Yes, yeah, it's got that to feel it to it. Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. And then yeah. the kind of characters that I'm in there, and I kind of thought, yeah, that sounds a bit right. Yes. That, that must have been quite good fun then to kind of populate your village with characters. Absolutely. With to to go. I mean, no, there's not really any of the characters that, that I mentioned that, that come from the. I'm just trying to think. Because, I mean, I left there when I was about 12, I think it was. Right. And we moved into Dumfries. Um, so my memory is all a bit kind of hazy and topsy-turvy anyway. And, and I think a kid, your memory of adults is... is, yeah. is it, it can be really strong, but it also can be totally wide of the mark. You're absolutely right. So um, I'm not sure. There's one character in it, I call him Sailor. And I was back in the village oh, quite a few years ago and I bumped into a guy who has his kind of demeanour of just, I can do everything and he's, you know, he's got an old tractor as well, you know, and he does, you know, he's a kind of odd handyman for the whole village and somehow he came into the, in, into the novel. Um, but I don't think any any of the rest of them. No, they just yeah. came from wherever they come from. Because yeah. there are there are lovely kind of coterie of characters who kind of interact with them right from the beginning, and it's great to kind of show how he's received. And actually, I was thinking about the two books because you bring back in his children. Yeah. Who he still thinks of as the accusation. Yes. But I think perhaps more warmly. Than yes, he it's did. more in an affectionate yeah, way now. Exactly. Yeah. And it's lovely to see that they really care for him and yes. worry about him and there's a lot of love there and yeah. also a lot of forgiveness and I think that goes for both books. Yeah. And there's something about Morris that people are willing to, because he still makes mistakes and uh, you know there's some really make you quite cringe yes. uh, certain things that happen. Um, but there's something about him that you want to and you're on his side. Yes, he is hapless. Yes, there's no d no doubt of that, and he, socially though awkward mis well. socially awkward, and th he is very misguided, 
you know, uh, in what he thinks. But he tries to do his best, but my goodness, he, he misses the target so often. Yeah. You know, that was the thing. And he's, he's very human in that way. I think that's, that's absolutely that. right. Yeah. He's such a believable character right through both books. Yeah. You know, that this, despite everything, despite your falls, one man just to pick himself up again with often the help of his family yes. and the people he meets, the kindness yep. of strangers. Yeah. Like Absolutely, yes. Because, I mean, when he goes back to the village, they, they are all strangers, yeah. really. I mean, he vaguely recognises the guy that used to be the postman that yeah. lives opposite. But I don't know he recognises that many people. And when he does, he actually almost feels a twinge of guilt in some way yeah. that he should be... And he doesn't really know how to relate to them anymore and, and whether to say that he does come... It takes him quite a time to almost own up that he used to live in the village. Yeah. He's not just a visitor. But he's not very sure why he's, he's unable to do it, but he just finds he is unable to do it. Yeah, to... and maybe that's the thing between your dreams of what things are going to be like or your, your, your thoughts in the best possible way. I'm going to start a new life at 60 in the place I grew up and it's all going to be well... And then the reality often turns yeah. out not to be the, that way. And he has dreams in, in both books. You know, the yeah. music's very central. Yes, still, that's very central to him. Yeah. Um, that's almost his biggest passion. Yeah. And his dream is that he's going to get the string quartet and, and make the music, and it just never quite happens. Never. Yes. So, well, somehow. I think if we had written a string quartet at the end of the novel, I think everyone would have been very surprised. That would have been the Hollywood ending. Yes, yeah. ah, that's true. <laughs> oh, well, if, if that's that what they want, they can have it. <laughs> no, no, I, I think it would be... Anyway, we certainly wouldn't be right to, to, to do that. But who knows? But I think that idea of kind of unfulfilled dreams, if that's the right yes. term, is an interesting one, because that... That's so many people, you know, other life gets in the way of mm. the greatest plans and that sort of what happens to him. Yeah. At the beginning, it's, a, it's not just the alcohol, it's the job. Yeah. And it's the whole situation that he finds himself, which he finds unfulfilling. Yeah. And this time around, there are opportunities to, to be fulfilled, but he still, you know, almost self-destructs. Yes, I mean, he doesn't give himself a chance, certainly from... When he, you know, he leaves school, he goes down to London. He um, he ends up getting the getting the job, become the executive. And I would guess at no point in all the way through that does he thinking, "What am I doing? What do I really want out of life?" And then it's only much later on that he's beginning to think, "God, how much time have I got left? I want to make the most of it." Yeah. And I messed up my job. I've messed up my marriage. Right. Just put these out the road. Now I can get on with being me and do this what I've always wanted to do. But of course, it's not as simple as that. Wherever you go, you're yeah. taking yourself with you. Exactly. And that's that's, the, that's yeah. the situation. And I think that is so relatable. Um, that idea of, uh, you know, you start out young and you think, you, for Morris, well, I've got the future's ahead of me and I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. And then in the same of my voice, we see how that stagnated. Yeah. Terribly. And even now he thinks I've still got a chance to do this, but he knows times. Yeah. Now. And that's what makes it so poignant when you bring in lockdown. Because yes. everyone it was put on hold. It was everything was put on hold. And that of course is the point when I we go just into the first few days of lockdown yeah. and, and we we leave him at this point. Yeah. You know, and and he says something like lockdown, I've been in lockdown all my life, you know, and it's who I am. And he's just rattling the bars of the cage yeah. a lot of the time. It's so interesting reading those sections, particularly when he goes to the supermarket. Is it in Lockerbie? Does it make yes, it? Is that's yeah. right. He yeah. goes to the super supermarket and he's there to kind of hopefully discreetly buy some vodka. Yes. And it's packed and people are acting in strange ways. Yes. And to read it, it almost made me feel like that's history already that time. Yeah. And almost like science fiction because it just is so strange that that's how we were know. at that time. And I'd, you know, once I'd realised what, what, what was going on, I, I began to remember things that I've just forgotten, even though they were only, what, three years ago? 
and how we weren't, weren't allowed to meet people, we weren't allowed to do this, not allowed to do that. You had to queue outside the, outside the shop. They would only allow six people in a big supermarket and all this. It was bizarre. And then the panic buying. Yes. That, 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 that I did remember going into and seeing frantically people. Pasta going, people going oh, to eat pasta yeah, for the rest pasta. of the days. Yes. But it's true, sometimes I'll go into, say, a bank or a post office and they'll still have the sticker saying stay two metres yep. around the person. That's right, that's right, yes. That was it. it does seem unreal. And the whole time seems unreal, and I'm really interested in how that's affected us as yeah. people in the long term. You know, yeah, it would. Time. Certainly, is. I mean, my my wife is, is is Swiss, and you know, we go over there and, and to stay with her parents, you know, visit for yeah. usually once or twice a year. And we went. It was, I think, lockdown had nearly finished, and we went over. And we realised, in fact, that it was in Britain, it was like this. Yeah, it was yeah. a lot more relaxed in Switzerland. Oh, you would true. think this would be really, a, you know, tight. tight yeah. oh, the exact opposite. But when we arrived about midnight off our late train um, from the airport, and Dora and, and Lucas, that's uh, uh, my in-laws, they greeted us, they stayed up late, because they're, they're in their 80s, stayed up late to greet us. And it immediately, and I was thinking, God, what do we do? Can I, can I touch them? Yeah. Can I do anything? I don't know. And she just, got, just immediately embraced me. And so I just did that back. And, I was like, and then I stepped back and I said, Dora, you know, this, you're the first person I've embraced, apart from Reggie, for about two years, yeah. you know? And she could not believe it. That's she said, what on earth has been going on? What? And they'd had family in and out. All the time, yeah. yeah. There was no, you know, they had a, a you know, they, they, I think they were allowed about eight or nine people. Or, I mean, were, it wasn't just only on Christmas Day or yeah. whatever it was. All the time, there's no problem. I guess there was no. It doesn't seem to have been a right or wrong way to do no, these things. I, I know, except we ended up with an awful lot of problems here. I yeah. mean, the, the mental health yeah. fallout is going to be huge, huge, as you rightly say. I think that's right, I think. Yeah. Uh, 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 as a country and, and beyond, we haven't really dealt with it. No. And that's why it's so interesting to read about it in fiction, which is still yeah. quite rare, and people haven't written a yeah. lot about it in that way. Yeah. It's, it's only, you know, as you say, the kind of end of it. But that whole situation, it just seemed... It just seemed suddenly really strange. And it actually like remind, science fiction almost. Yeah, or, or yeah. it actually reminded me of scenes where uh, Morris is drunk in the side of my yes, body. So it's quite unreal. Everything is unreal to yeah. him. Yeah. Yes. Uh, uh, and of course, because he's, for a, he's off the wagon at that point, yeah. you kind of think... Because when I started reading it, it took me a while to realise... Oh, for what it was. It's the yes. beginning of lockdown. Yeah. It isn't him kind of, yeah. you know, paranoid or, or anxious or all of these things, yeah. although that's... That, that's that's, yeah, that's given. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And at the end, again, a bit like Sound of My Voice, you've got a scene where, as a reader, I was wondering, oh, there's more to come, but I don't know if you ever think there is more to come. <sighs> no, but certainly not at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, but then I said that you 30 years yeah, ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, 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 it's this wonderful um, questions that you have, and, and as a reader, you can imagine yourself, well, I wonder what happens to Morris as he leaves from the yeah. because again, it's that travel, you know, in both, well, one, I suppose, he comes to a halt, and then the other one, he's leaving. Yes. Yeah, so, well, to be honest, Alistair, I have no idea. Is it, do you find it strange or surprising when people like me who are kind of obsessed with, certainly the first book and then the second one as well, examine it in such detail? No, I'm, I'm very, to be honest, I'm very touched. Oh, good. Yes, no, I'm just, really touched. Uh, because I often wonder, you know, sometimes I'll write reviews and people go, I didn't think about that at all. Or I'll do yes. musicians, you know, oh, did you, you really get influenced by that band and they say, no, I heard of them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. These things happen, but then, yeah. Well, we don't know. We don't know what's happening happening to us half the time, anyway. So it is really good if someone's read read something in in depth and then is asking me questions and commenting because it's really giving me other ways of looking at, in fact, what I've done. 
You know, and there are lots of other ways. And something you shared with Morris is a love of music. Yes. You're a musician yourself. And I was wondering if music plays a part when you're writing. Not, not really. I mean, I don't have music on oh, when I'm, when I'm writing or, or, or anything like that. Um, but I have I listen to music every day. Yeah. You know, I mean, after after we've <laughs> a glimpse into our domestic life, after um, after we've had dinner, nice dinner, Reggie's cook, couple of glasses of wine, she'll go and work. Ah. And, <laughs> and I just go smack, and I'll go ne- I'll go next door, put on the headphones, and listen to a string quartet or a symphony or something, you know, because that's what I really love to do, you know, and, it, and it's great. But the idea of going and working, just, <laughs> I can't even imagine it, yeah. It's interesting because you're also obviously a well-known poet. And I'm reading uh, Don Patterson oh, yeah. at the moment. Yeah. And at the very beginning, he talks about the difference between being a poet and other forms of art, not just being a novelist, but other things as yeah. well. And he says some of his writer friends can work like a working day, you know, they start at nine and they finish at, he says, 12. I think, you know, he's maybe having a dink. Yeah. <laughs> but, and he says, poetry is different. It comes when it comes and at different yes. times. Is that something you need to do? I'd, I'd, yes, I, I, I would agree. I would agree. Certainly there's, there's something more... I mean, for me, writing fiction is a spontaneous thing, but I do it regularly. Yeah. Um, whereas with the poetry, yes, it was more, mm, yes, it was more suddenly, you know, you're, you're brushing your teeth or you're at the bus stop or something, kind of with these moments between, it's a moment between moments, if you like, and a first a few words will come up out of nowhere, and it's not that I've been thinking about them, but they just come up and I think, oh, that was, that's maybe that's the beginning of a poem, and, and I'll try and hold it in my head if I can, yeah. and, you know, and then I'll get a chance and write them down, and then and then start working on them after so that. Ultimately, as your working process on whether it's a libretti or, or music or whatever, kind of similar in that there'll be different ideas that it comes to you rather than yes, setting oh, it to yeah. follow it. Yes, unless I mean. I, I, I having having said all this, and it sounds all very creative and wonderful, and it's all true. But I learned so much when I, for several, well, quite a number of years, um, I was not also. A, 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 I did quite a lot of book reviews, but I began for the the Herald, um, Sunday Herald, uh, as it was then, to to write think pieces. Right. You know, on yeah. on on the arts and politics and life, whatever. And my goodness me, I learned so much about writing from that. That's you know, I had to have 600 words ah, by Tuesday, yeah. not 800 because I had a lot more to say, not 400. And if it was 1,200 words, it had to be 1,200 words and it had to be ready by the Tuesday. You know, that was it. It didn't yeah. matter. That was it. And I really learned very much, to, even more than ever, to make every word count. And to think of the before the sub gets hold of it, make sure, you know, I'm as close to the deadline, both in the word count and the time itself, that it's not going to get changed much. And so I, it's, a, it's still writing, but it's a different discipline. Than yes. Writing. Oh, and the other thing that I learned there was definitely, which I, I don't know if I did so much before, but was to think, yeah, there's going to be a reader. Yeah. And, you know, somewhere along the line, I've got to take the reader into consideration. And have I, ex- and now when I read it over, near the, this is near the end, it's almost as if I cease to be the writer and become the reader. And I just think, you know, is this clear? Does this make sense? You know, is this bit really boring, am I finding, you know? Yeah. And, and that, I, all that I learned from, from writing these articles. I mean, it was a great learning process. That's really interesting, because I often wonder if writers have a, a reader in mind um, I mean, who is your first reader? Is it Reggie? Well, Reggie's my first reader, and then I've got um, two other friends, both both Andrew Gregg. Yes. Um, Andrew and I have known each other, God, I mean, <laughs> that's nearly half a century <laughs> when I think about it. And uh, Brian McCabe, he's, he's another one. Um, we, we, we met... Uh, 
doing doing events way back in the beginning of the 70s and uh, we read each other's work there and commented and gave feedback you know pretty frank and fearless yeah. feedback and that's up for what is really needed I mean yes. Reggie and I all have conversations you can never marry imagine <laughs> married couples really saying no this is just you know, Reggie will just say, forget it, that's not, <laughs> you know, whatever. Or, or yes, but you got you need more of this, you need more of that. And I know that whatever uh, the three of them are saying, if they're looking at the work, uh, that this is what they think, what they feel. Yeah. And that really helps me. And similarly, I do the same for them as well too, of course. And that sounds like and it's, it's great. Such it's so important. Yeah. I mean, I know people, that, there's a couple of writers, I, I just know, that read, write their work, and that's it. They just hand it over to the editor, and that's the first person that's, my God, I, I have a nightmare. I would imagine doing that. Because it can feel right, as I said earlier, it can yeah. feel right, but it doesn't mean to say it is. Yeah, and it's different. I mean, I've worked in editing for a short while, and sometimes when significant chunks need to come out and it's that is a difficult kind of yes oh it is but it's necessary yeah, yeah, it's and in the long term it's gonna it's gonna help yeah. you know it really will yeah. you know there's nothing worse I mean now I mean I read a lot of you know classic serious stuff and everything but I also read lots of crime lots of thrillers yeah. I love them yeah, and too. but what I can't stand is I'm afraid to say it's just bad writing and yes. overwriting, and it's sometimes it just sticks at a mile. And even though the plot's really good, it's got to be a hell of a good to overcome someone. It's just so much padding to fill out their whatever their word count had to be. Yeah, know. I think the best, particularly the best crime writing, really gets you turning the page. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. You don't think you've got a crime novel in you at some point? <laughs> <laughs> well. Mm, no, I think the, the research and the working, the consistency, the, I don't think I'd be very good at that. I think it would take me One thing forever. I perhaps or haven't mentioned in both books is there's, it's dark, but there's comedy there. There's yes, comedy yes, in, in it's both. a lot of comedy. Particularly I'm thinking of the scenes in my voice where there's the snowman. Oh, yes, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And also this time round, that scene we took, spoke about when he's trying to buy vodka and get yeah. it from his neighbours. Yes. Uh, those are, I mean, they're darkly comic. Yes, they are. There, there is a lot, of, a lot of comedy. I didn't realise it so much when I was when I was writing. I just felt it. Uh, it was just the way it was. Yeah. And then it was reviewed by um, Alan Massey and the Scotsman. That was mm. the first review he gave it. A, Really, a really nice review, and the f- almost the first thing he said was rich in comedy, and I thought what? And then I thought, God, yeah, maybe he's right. And I had a wee quick. And I thought, oh goodness me, <laughs> I didn't realise. And I think pff, comedy is what I, I think we need now. Yeah. Well, again, you know, I haven't struck me till we started speaking, but you mentioned that the sound of my voice came out kind of mid Thatcher. Yes. And all that that entailed, and now this has come out with the all the uh, kind of madness that's been going on yeah. in the country politically in particular for the last few years do you think that's coincidence or I think so. it seeps into it yeah. it seeps it seeps into the thing but it's it's it is very difficult to know what really is seeping into one's work yeah. when you're writing I, because I'm just the, the, I said first time that I realised that the sound of my voice which is quite dark we yeah, really say that but it's also as you rightly say quite funny was that um, three short ec- excerpts were done on Radio 3 that was back in the day when they used to do things like this you yeah. know, short excerpts from work in progress and the actor that took it picked up on the comedy that I hadn't oh that's really interesting and I just I was listening and I, th- and I thought god this is really funny <laughs> And I hadn't. And it, it wasn't funny, kind of ridiculous. It was. It was dark, but it was yeah. funny. Yeah. And I just hadn't picked up on that at all. That's really interesting. And the actor clued in immediately, and and wow, I just thought, man, that's, God, actors are just so wonderful. And that's, and they that's really, really interesting because they were looking at it almost as a script. Yep. Said, that's what it. Can we bring how can we? That? How can we? What can we bring? To, what is in here that yeah. can be brought out? Oh, yeah, it was, oh, it was great. I was really knocked out by it. 
are they going to do any audio version of? I don't. I, I don't. I mean, I'd like to. Um, we'll see. I'll maybe talk about talk about that with the publishers here. Yeah. See, or, or, or see. I don't know how to set about it. Yeah. When. Um, just by chance, I, I was. Someone told me that they they had come across this online. That there's been an audio version of the sound of my voice, right, in Spanish. <laughs> that is for sale. <laughs> to everything online. I mean, I don't know anything about this. Uh, that's you know, and I was very surprised to learn this. Yeah. But yeah, so I just oh well, fine. You know, I mean, I'd quite like to. I, I would quite like to do it because yeah, I, mean, I do. I, I like doing readings, so ah. um, I would. But well, we'll see. See yeah. what happens. I don't know what, what the process is to to do these things. And what is next for you? Are you working on anything you can tell us about? Well, uh, I did. Uh, my brother-in-law is a, a, a musician. This is in, in Switzerland. He's got the Swiss piano to you. They go all over the world, and he he did. Um, he asked me if I would write a text that they could do with uh, with his trio, with an actor, and he said it's got to be really, really funny. And, and and he'd come across something from way back in Dada times. It was a ballet about um, promiscuous kitchen utensils after hours, <laughs> <laughs> and and he, and he and he just gave me a short paragraph where they had um, the ballet movements and what they'd done in that. And and so I wrote this text, which in fact I just finished doing, uh, which I did it after after this. And God, I had such fun doing that. Brilliant. Because it was there was no darkness in this at all. Uh, it was just a kitchen. Well, the kitchen was in darkness, but oh no, the, no, the lights were left on. That was it. And all these kitchen utensils were flirting and doing all this sort of stuff. So that was great fun. But it did give me the, the feeling of gosh, yeah, I'd, I'd like to write co- something comic some comedy, but still rooted very much in in, uh, in the human conflict, if we can call it, or the, yeah. the, the struggle to whatever, to get through the day. But yes, I, I would like to have a go at a bit of comedy and see how that worked. Oh, fantastic. I look forward to that. Ron, it's always lovely to talk to you. Thank you so much for taking the time. Okay, well, thank you very much, Alistair, for, for inviting me to do this. It's been a real pleasure. And we'll be back soon with someone completely different. Cheers. Mm-hmm.